All right, 2 Timothy chapter number one, uh, verse number three. This is a, a, a wonderful passage of scripture. Again, it is a part of our lectionary. Uh, I was uh, uh, drawn to the passages of lament, and as I continued to do my prep and reading and studying, I certainly uh, got sucked into the rabbit hole of 2 Timothy uh, chapter number one. This is a, a, a letter that is often ascribed to Paul. This is likely Paul's last words to Timothy his uh, mentee, the person that, you know, he was pouring into that was taking care of many of his uh, assignments in different parts of the Roman Empire. And uh, Paul is likely writing this uh, from a place of incarceration. Paul wrote many of his letters while he was in jail, while he was in prison. Uh, Paul was not somebody who was able to, you know, freely move around. The scripture even says that even though, uh, Paul says, even though I am chained, the gospel I preach and I write about is unchained. Amen. I, I like that word play. Amen. That even if you find yourself in a place of bondage, the gospel, the scriptures, your faith need not be bound, even though we may find ourselves in a place of bondage. And Paul is continuing to admonish Timothy through these words of scripture uh, to be reminded that there is something unique and special that is within him that he ought to take care of, he ought to steward, he ought uh, to continue to cultivate. And that'll be the theme for our preaching today. Uh, simply the title, It's Already In You. It's Already In You. Let's take a look at verse number three. Uh, Paul says these words to Timothy, I am grateful to God. Somebody say, I'm grateful. Whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Verse number five, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first. Everybody say first. First in your grandmother, Lois, mm -hmm. and your mother, Eunice, all right? And now I am sure it lives in you. For this reason, I, uh, for this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands, for God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Verse number eight, do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to God's own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality, to light through the gospel. Verse number 11, for this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. For I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And I am sure that God is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse number 14, guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So yes, the title of today's message, it is already in you. Pat yourself on the chest and say, it's already in me. It's already in me. Father, bless the word that has been read for the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And may the preaching and the teaching of your word be easy 
Lord God, through the power of your spirit, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. You know, uh, what is clear to me in these moments uh, is that another passage of scripture that Paul writes talks about how all of creation is groaning. It is groaning for and waiting for the appearing, the glorious appearing of the children of God. That in many respects, we are in a moment and we're in a time where we can see the groaning of creation. We can see literally all of creation having these expressions of anxiety, you know, the climate change that we are seeing playing out all across literally the world is in my mind an expression of the groaning of creation. This idea that something is just not right. Something is off balance. Uh, our hearts remain with our loved ones in Florida whose lives were once more upended by the Hurricane Ian. Amen. And you know these names, they're they, they're so fascinating, you know, they, they, they create the names based off of uh, just the alphabet. So that means there have already been several hurricanes, some of which did not make landfall, just percolating out in the ocean because of the warmth of the water. And that water gets so warm that it gets literally caught up into uh, the moisture and the, the heat uh, of the atmosphere and turns these these simple winds that are, are, are useful in some places into a, a literal destructive force that upends people's lives. I was talking, I believe with, I don't know, maybe it was uh, Brother Antonio or another one of our staff who said that the water in Florida, someone got in there uh, and they measured the water. It was, uh, took the temperature of the water, it was 84 degrees. Amen. That, 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 that the water, amen, is groaning. We got uh, a drought out here on this side of the country where we see the, the expression of, of a climate out of balance with such dry grass and trees and forests that uh, we often are uh, having the, the, the air poisoned by uh, fires that kick up all of these uh, part particulates and things into the air that make it very difficult for us to breathe. We got earthquakes, amen. We got in the scriptures it says that, that the earth is groaning. And I am often one of these folks who believe that uh, when the earth groans, when creation groans, dare I say even when the people uh, in our communities groan, when they mourn, when they lament, it is a perfect time for we, the people of God, to begin to appear, to begin to show ourselves as a source and as a herald of good news. Not good news that is, uh, you know, lying to one another, like telling folks that everything is great, great, when in actuality things are tough, tough. Amen. But the good news is that there is something inside of us, even in the midst of our hardship and difficulty, that gives us the opportunity, even in storms and, and, and times of trial, to continue to persist and move forward in ways that bring glory to God and healing to our communities. I mean, I want you to think about uh, the kind of people you look for when times get hard. I want you to think about the kinds of people we run to when uh, we are in a state of emergency. There are folks in our societies that are characterized, they're deemed, they are anointed, if you will, they are appointed, they even have a uniform, and their position in society is to show up when things go bad. And, and they're paid to do so, right? They, they, are, they are told that when you wake up and when you leave your home and when you go to work, your responsibility is to make sure that if things are going badly, you are there to be a solution to someone's problem. Hello, somebody. 
And that is why, you know, for many of us who are engaged in the work of justice, we are so uh, verbose about uh, injustice because it is unjust to have folks who are supposed to show up and be a help and they show up and become a problem. Amen. I, I was listening to, uh, unfortunately, it was sent to me, an uh, 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 ad by a uh, 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 senator down in um, Louisiana, and he's running for office, and uh, he's already in the Senate, and he's, you know, one of these folk who, who you know, uh, uh, bemoans woke people, you know, and so, you know, he's already got his little code, uh, not, not so subtle code language, right? And, you know, woke people, if you don't want, uh, uh, we don't, if you, woke people who hate the police and who uh, are out here and, 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 and despise those who are coming to help. And then the final line of his of his of his ad was uh, if you are in trouble and you don't like the police next time call a crackhead and I sat there and I listened to that and I replayed it a few times to make sure I wasn't you know uh, reading into anything he said <laughs> and I said to myself you know it is so fascinating to me that at every level of government, we have people who are supposed to be part of a solution. And yet they show up in the world as part of the problem. And it began to make me ask God, Lord, what do people say of your church? In the midst of tragedy and challenge, how do we show up in people's worst moments and when people need help? Are we so brazen in our speech and in our characterizations and in our descriptions of what is going on that it causes uh, some harm and some pain like the words of this, con of this uh, senator running for office? Or are we people that when folks see us coming clearly on assignment, they are literally happy that we have been introduced into their lives at their most difficult moment? I mean, it is important for you, it is important for me, it's important for us to remember that part of our task as God's church in the world is we are God's representatives. Amen. And we are people who are constantly being transformed into the image of God, which means that we don't necessarily have to show up with a sense of perfection, but we ought to show up with a sense of purpose. In that, Lord, I know that when I show up to trouble, I am someone that trouble knows is here to be a part of the solution. I'm not here to show up in a way that pours gasoline on somebody's trouble. I'm not here to show up in a way that causes people to have their heart literally melted or turned away from the help and the solutions that are near them. And it is in this way, child of God, that I think one of the reasons why so many of us are often paralyzed or are or, or often a little torn between how we show up is we often think that the power needed to show up is external to us. But I want you to know that God has put something in each and every one of us that is so unique and so gifted that when you show up, it cannot be duplicated or replicated. But it is something that can be a blessing to someone in your life. You ought to pat yourself on the chest one more time and say, it's already inside of me. Say that. And you ought to remind yourself frequently that I have what it takes to be an asset in every situation. I mean, you may not have the education that they have, but you still have what it takes. You may not have the money that they have, but you still have what it takes. You may still be on your healing journey, but you still have what it takes because God has already placed it inside of you. Oh, I wish I had somebody who understood that there's something inside of you that could be a blessing to someone else, even right now. Uh, you know, this is why I like this passage, because it's something so powerful about Paul writing while he's in jail. 
Paul is not writing this, uh, you know, while he's uh, on the beach in Jamaica, you know, uh, thinking about uh, all the great triumphs he's had. Paul is not pulling this out of his greatest moment, you know, while he's making a speech in front of hundreds and thousands of people saying, you know what, I want you to know that, you know, there's something great inside of you. No, Paul is writing from a place where he should be depressed. He should feel forsaken. He should feel isolated. He should feel let down. And Paul is writing with the consciousness of what? That there's something that has been placed inside of me. That can still be a blessing to you, even though you are free and I am bound. Lord, have mercy. I wonder, I wonder, can you just think of your journey in life and think of the places where you have found yourself feeling inadequate. And yet still God says there's something inside of you. There's a gift. There's a story. There's a contribution in the text. Paul says it like this. There's faith. Somebody say faith. There's some faith. There is something that has been placed inside of you. And this is what I love about what he says. Your faith is trustworthy. Somebody holler, my faith is trustworthy. Say it again. My faith is trustworthy. Verse number five, he says it like this, that I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois. And then in your mother Eunice, and now I am confident it's in you. I want you to know, child of God, that what's in you did not just come out of the air. What's in you is a part of the historical legacy of somebody praying for you, somebody lifting you up, somebody depositing something inside of you. This is why it's so important for all of us to keep reminding ourselves that we are not the creation of our own hands. You know, it's so fascinating when we see how this uh, social context makes us so ahistorical as if we just got here through our own hard work. I ain't saying you didn't work hard, but I want you to know if it wasn't for what was put in inside of you, it wasn't for that legacy, you would have to be working a lot more harder than you are today in order to get to what you got. Hello, somebody. Amen. Some of us think, oh, you know, it's just because, you know, I studied and I studied all night long for this exam. Yeah, you did that. You did. But but there's other things that have went into your success beside your study prowess. Some of us is like, oh, you know, you know, I, 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 I saved them all my money and I got this down paid for this house. You did that. Yes, you did. But it's also because there, there, there was a housing market and there was some other money and there were some other, you know, factors that, that you couldn't store up in order to get through some of the red tape that they put in place to keep other folks out of that situation. That our faith, our legacy, there is a historical trajectory to what makes you and I able to move with this kind of sincerity and the scripture says that your grandmother Lois how many know you had a grandmama a grandfather somebody older than you that helped to contribute to where you are today what does that mean that means that if they poured into you you and I have an obligation to pour into the next generation you know, this is one of the first times in, in at least our recent history that this current generation is now literally separated from a generation or two before it. One thing that COVID did, we found that COVID has disproportionately caused the transition, the death, and even at times the, the paralysis of a whole older generation of people. And that it has literally caused a younger generation to be without their elders and their seniors. The social context of what this moment has created requires then we as God's people to stand in the gap. Faith that is handed on to us means that you and I have a responsibility to stand in the gap. To be someone who does not, uh, you know, become ahistorical and feel like, well, you know, uh, these ain't my kids, so I ain't got to worry about them. I want you to know, child of God, that you got to worry about somebody else's kids. Hello, saints. Amen. <laughs> and in as much as some of us don't want to worry about nobody else's kids, if you don't worry about someone else's kids, guess what? They kids going to mess with your kids. <laughs> 
They're going to influence your kids in all kinds of ways. They're going to influence your kids, and then you have to deal with their kids anyway. Hello, somebody. Anybody ever had to deal with someone else's kids in order just to help your kids not become them kids? <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Amen. That there is a moment where the church, our responsibility is to care for people outside of our own nuclear family constitution. Did you not know that there, through the history of the world, has never been until maybe the last hundred years the idea that a family constitution was so insular that we were not called to care for the whole community? Folks were raised in villages, amen, not mansions. Hello, somebody. And so our, 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 our task, our, our commitment is to literally remind ourselves that the trustworthiness of the faith that we have, it is a legacy. It has been handed down. And now our, our task is to continue to hand that down as well. That what makes our faith trustworthy is that we make a commitment to pass it on. We make a commitment to share our values. We make a commitment to put these lessons, this wisdom, and we spread it beyond our own circles. Because that is how our faith gets passed down with sincerity. The second thing that the text says that I love is that it says simply that you must, some text says, stir up the gift that is within you. Another uh, version says you must rekindle the gift that is within you. The NIV says you must fan the flame of the gift that is within you. What is the presupposition here? That all of us have a gift that's within us. All of us have something that God allows us to start off with. That none of us are coming to the table without something God has placed in our hands. And child of God, today is a good day to reclaim your gift and to reclaim your authority over what God has placed inside of you. And if the apostle is right, and I think he is, he is reminding you and I that there's something that has been placed in you that God has given you the responsibility to cultivate, to add to it, to, to make sure that what's in you does not die does not shrivel up, does not become atrophied. That in these moments where the revealing of God's people as a solution to the many problems, uh, people are waiting and hoping, God is asking, is there anyone that I've already given a gift to, ready and willing to show up? Is there anyone that I've already anointed, already appointed? You may not have a uniform that people can see on the outside, but you have a uniform that is in your spirit. You have something that God has placed inside of you that is undeniable, but you got to rekindle it. Sometimes life throws a wet blanket over your gift. Sometimes the hurt and the shame, it throws a wet blanket over your gift. Sometimes doubt and anxiety causes you to be paralyzed with your gift. But you know what the scripture says? That you got to literally stir it up. I don't know how many of you have ever, you know, had ketchup and, you know, you didn't have a whole lot of ketchup in the, in, in, in the, little, in the little bottle and you was trying to squeeze the ketchup out for all you could. I'm going to have to get real, real basic with some of y'all because y'all act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Hey Amen. You, you got a bottle with a little ketchup and you, sh you, 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 you got the ketchup and you really, you, you doing all kind of things and trying to get the little bit of it out. And in order for you to get that little bit of catch about, sometimes you got to do what? Just add a little, little bit of water. You don't add a lot of water because then the ketchup is no longer ketchup. It's just some red water. Red water ain't the same thing as ketchup. Hello, somebody. How many of you know sometimes you have a gift and it's gotten so dry? It's gotten so hard and so, so collected at the bottom that you need to add a little bit of something to that thing. Well, guess what God is telling you to add? Through the Holy Spirit, add a little water to your gift. Because when you add a little water to your gift, that's not enough. You know, the water, if it's not, if, it's, if, if, if it don't get in there, it'll just sit at the top. 
of the little that remains. But then you take your little, your little bottle with the water in it. What do you do? You, you do a little shaking of it. Lord, have mercy. Some of us are wondering why God's shaking us up so much. Because God is realizing I put a little water in your life. And I want you to allow the little water that I'm adding to your life to take that little bit of gift that's still inside of you that you've not used yet. To take that little bit of gift that's inside of you that you've walked away from. Uh, to take that little gift that's inside of you that you seem to be afraid to activate uh, and God is saying I'm going to shake you up a little bit uh, I'm going to take you and I'm going to turn you upside down uh, I'm going to turn you right side up uh, I'm going to put a little force in there uh, to get you dislodged from that which you become comfortable in uh, and don't worry child of God uh, when God begins to shake you up uh, because there's water with that shake there's power with that shake and I've heard the power of the living God start moving inside of God's people it don't matter if it's a hurricane that comes it don't matter if it's a fire that comes it don't matter if it's a tornado that comes because the power of the Holy Ghost inside the body of the believer inside the spirit of the believer it begins to unleash some power you've not used before do I have a witness today that can say shake me up God because it's already inside of me and God when you shake me up I want you to put me to work I don't want to be somebody that has all this anointing has all this gift has all this power and not use what you've given me the Bible says that God has has not given us uh, the spirit of fear uh, but of power power uh, love uh, and self-discipline uh, what is he saying uh, God is saying I've given you power uh, in the Greek it's dynamis uh, which means dynamite uh, God says I've given you the ability uh, to be dynamic uh, to get in a situation uh, and to bring life there uh, to get in a situation uh, and to blow some things up uh, to get in a situation uh, and change the environment uh, it's already in you uh, power uh, to change the situation uh, God's giving you love uh, somebody holler love in the Greek it's agape which means it's unconditional it's universal that means when you show up you're not showing up with prerequisites but I'm showing up with open arms I can love you through your hardship I can love you through your depression I can love you through your pain because God has given you love and then self-discipline that just means that you got to control yourself you can't be wild out of control because God needs somebody who can stand there and say this is how it is and I'm confident that the God in me can bless the God in you God has given you power love and a sound mind this is what's in you somebody shout hallelujah it's already in you and what's in you needs to be worked out of you it needs to show up in the world it needs to be manifest in your environment it's true child of God creation is groaning but guess what the church is doing the power should be manifesting and I want you child of God to be confident that whatever circumstance you're in God has placed the gift inside of you stand with us and let's prepare to pray I love verse number 14. I didn't get to it. We're getting ready to take communion, but verse 14 says, guard the good treasure that has been entrusted to you. 
it's really important for us to appreciate in this moment that what God has placed in you requires you to guard it, to protect it, to cultivate it, to rekindle it, to ensure that it's not snatched, it's not neutralized, it's not trivialized, but guard the gift that is within you. God, we lift up our hands to you today. We want to say thank you, Lord, that you've put something inside of us that no one can snatch out. No one can neutralize. No one can remove. I pray, God, that we would be conscious of our gift. That the gift you placed in us, God, would be cultivated. It would be stirred up. It would be unleashed into a world searching for everything you've given us to bless them with. So may peace, may joy, may healing, may hope, may it abound within us. And God, may it be unleashed to the world around us. Do it in the name of Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for the gift of the gospel. We thank you for the gift of our faith that has been handed down to us week after week, month after month, year after year. It is this precious faith that lives within us through the power of your spirit, but is also practiced among us through the gift of community. As we prepare ourselves to bring the sacraments and to come and to remind ourselves of this great faith that has been handed down to us. God, we ask you to renew our faith once again. Somebody say, renew us, Lord. We ask you, God, to remind us that it is only through the broken body and the sacrificed blood that you have given us this model that even when we're broken, God, life can still come. Even when we are being offered up as fodder and sacrifice, life can still emerge. That we, God, are your people and together life through the power of your spirit is always at work among us. So bless God these sacraments that we bring to you. May they, God, have the same power it had on the night you gave it to your disciples. And may it be for us strength. May it be for us anointing. May it be for us power. In Jesus' name. Thank you.